What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to our new broadcast station, KBOO, in Portland, Oregon. Thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Sasha Altman de Brule. Sasha is diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He's a writer and a gardener and a strategist for the Mad Revolution. Sasha is one of the co founders of the Icarus Project, which is a peer run alternative mental health community. And he currently lives in Oakland, California. Sasha, it's really great to have you on Madness Radio. Welcome. It's so good to be here, Will. Yeah, we've been plan we've been planning on doing this interview for for quite a while. Of course, we've been working together for many for many years, and it's just really great to have you finally on Madness Radio and hear about what you're up to and where things are going, and have a discussion about all things madness related. <laughs> so, welcome, Sasha. You were one of the co-founders um, with Ashley Jacks McNamara of the Icarus Project, which is a really innovative alternative mental health uh, community. We're going to be hearing a lot about. Um, in this interview, I've been involved with the Icarus Project for a long time, and you've been helping cultivate it and and grow it. And I, I want to just start the interview, though, talking with you about where the origins of the Icarus Project and the origins of your own involvement with Mad Pride and mental health come from, because you were very much involved in the counterculture, the New York City squatter scene, the punk scene, uh, traveling, and a, very, a lot of countercultural activism, permaculture, uh, before Icarus. Why don't you just sort of give us a sense of of where you come from in terms of your, of your own roots. Okay, so I grew up in New York City, and I grew up in a kind of cultural milieu in the 1980s that was, um, you know, I was raised by political activists and, and intellectuals, and, um, but folks who were pretty actually culturally straight and culturally um, mainstream kind of folks on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And um, when I was a young teenager, well, when I was 13, my dad died. And it was a big transformation for me, and I and um, I ended up leaving the kind of world that I grew up in, and and venturing down to this kind of dark underworld of the the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which which at the time in the late '80s was this um, thriving community of anarchists and squatters and and freaks and folks who like kids who ran away from home and and came and lived down in the abandoned buildings there, and and um, folks who were living in Tompkins Square Park, which at the time was the, the only park in New York City that didn't have a curfew. It was a really different New York City than the New York City that exists now. This is in the mid-80s, uh, early 80s? No, nah, late, like, edge of the 90s, you know, 89, like, so picture me, like, 14-year-old kid getting into punk rock and coming down there and ending up smack in the middle of the Tompkins Square riots and watching my friends get beaten bloody and, like, just, like, just in these street battles with police and feeling free for the first time in my life and feeling more importantly like I was part of a community for the first time in my life because when I was a kid I was always I never really fit in I, I was always felt kind of awkward in my body and I was not a happy child you know so for the first time in my life I found a whole bunch of other people who I could relate to and where I felt like people weren't judging me so the Tompkins Square riots were really about this countercultural scene getting space for itself well, the Tompkins Square riots were really about gentrification. I mean, they were about a transition that was happening. I mean, the 1980s were such a crazy time. For the first time since the 30s and the Depression, there was homeless people everywhere. And, you know, as we know our mad history, the Reagan, when he came into office, he let out all these folks who had been locked up in mental hospitals, you know, without support. There was a, these promises of creating uh, community-supported mental health centers that didn't manifest. And so there was all these folks who were really struggling out on the street. And so for me, as like a 14-year-old kid, being in a park with a bunch of crazy homeless people, you know, lo and behold, I felt like I fit in somewhere. I mean, it's a funny thing to say, but it's really true. Like when I think about the origins of my relationship to, to the Mad Pride movement, that's really where it started. It was like, oh, here's somewhere where I actually... I feel like I fit in. Because the squatter scene is really kind of a total mix of people from different backgrounds and classes and people who are runaway kids from more privileged backgrounds and people who've been homeless for a long time. And Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and there was this basement called the Anarchist Switchboard where we would hang out. And I feel like the society that we live in, 
you know, that for so much of so many of us, we don't have families that support us. We don't have community st- structures that are intact. And so, you know, we're lucky if we find something, you know. And for me, as this alienated kid trying to find my place in the world, yeah, like hanging out with a mix of folks who really did come from all these different backgrounds and it was hard to tell where people were from and for me I have to say like as a as a teenager like I definitely did not talk much about the apartment building on the Upper West Side where my mom lived with the doorman that I you know like I, there was like all kinds of ways that you could kind of adopt a, an identity and become you know play with things in a way that so part of the freedom was creating a new identity for yourself yeah i mean that was huge you know i mean i think like for when when you're a teenager trying to figure out where you fit in it's interesting thinking about it now you know as i get older and i and i I realize more and more how we all have these roots that it doesn't it it doesn't take that many generations of looking to realize that we have these these rich cultural traditions that we come from. But, you know, especially in the United States of America, we're like this nation of immigrants that get that's part of the whole deal of of American identity is like giving up where you come from. A huge part of of the identity that I adopted was this like identity of punk and anarchism and and have it like knowing that I had a whole pack of people who were all like had my back and were all um, fighting. Tell us a little bit about that for people, someone who's never really been exposed to anarchism and punk. And a lot of it was around the music scene. You were actually um, pretty well known as a musician in New York City with the punk band um, Choking Victim. (laughs) Yeah, well, that was the that was one of the bands that I ended up playing in when I was a teenager, for sure. I know it's a difficult question. It's a difficult question. (laughs) What's what's punk rock? (laughs) Can you tell us, Mr. DeBrule, what is punk? What is this thing called punk rock? Human beings, we're like, we we crave, we're social creatures, right? We want to be a part of community. And we live in these really alienated times where everyone's just sitting alone in front of computer screens, talking to each other on social networking sites, you know? But there's something fundamental about, like, getting together with a group of people and having these cathartic experiences, you know? And, you know, I was raised in a very secular environment. You know, I wasn't raised going to church or to synagogue, really. And, um going to a punk rock show as like a young teenager where a band is playing and there's a whole bunch of people packed into a dark space and everyone is like dancing all over each other and it's like the super like crazy like your heart is pounding and you feel like you're part of something totally incredible it's like church i suppose is what you know later on in the story you know i'll tell you about like living in a yoga ashram for nine months and my my, like how that's affected my take and how i think about punk rock we're living in really secular times where people don't talk about God so much anymore, but people really want that experience of oneness. And, and I guess there's, there's the dominant culture, you know, there's a one, there's a kind of feeling people get from being a part of like watching, Oh, like a football game or something, you know, where then they know that like everyone else is watching it and you know, they're, they're part of, you know, this huge cultural social phenomenon. And then there's this thing that you feel sometimes when you're just with a pack of your friends and you feel like you're part of something that has its roots in something timeless and you're you're doing something that is affecting the world in a different way like an underground kind of way punk was a subculture that it came out of the you know 70s and in, in New York and in and in London and then made its its way around the world and there's like it branched out in all these different directions and eventually ended up having like a really positive effect on a lot of people and then becoming popularized but it comes out of underground culture and I guess the reason I I mention it because I feel like it ties into this whole question of the Icarus Project is that we you know when we started the Icarus Project that we were creating something from the underground we were taking something from the underground and trying to take lessons and then use them to to shift the culture, to change the culture. Because it was definitely a very underground existence that you were living at that time. You were squatting and you're also traveling, jumping trains, going around the country and being part of this whole sort of underground network of punk and DIY anarchist uh, community. Well, let's get let's just get some clarity on that now. So, I mean, the thing is that, like, I lived at my mom's house when I was a teenager, you know, and I was like one of those kids that would go down to the Lower East Side and hang out in the squats and then go back to my mom's house. But it wasn't it wasn't until I was 20 years old. And I because I had this whole thing. I was playing in a punk rock band, this man choking victim. Right. And I was going to Columbia University and I had this double life that was really hard to reconcile. And I mean, 
for me, when I dropped out of school and I quit that band and I started traveling and, and riding freight trains and, and having all these adventures, it was this huge, huge feeling of, I don't know, I've been like studying the existentialist lately and there's this whole, um, this, there's this whole idea of what it means to, to be a, to, to what it, to, to be true to yourself, you know, and to what it means to be a person who, you know, the sense of like not being split up in a bunch of different directions, but being like, this is what I'm doing. This is what I, you know, and I think in when I was 20 years old and I dropped out of school and I started traveling, I was very much like, man, I've been tied my whole life and I'm going to figure out how to be free. I'm going to figure out how to, to live wild and live large and live in a way that I can feel really good about myself. And all this time you were also writing about your experiences and you became pretty well known in the community as a as a writer and a, a zine publisher, right? Yeah, yeah. So I wrote all these zines about riding freight trains and, and um and, and having adventures and that was kind of yeah, that was that was an identity that I, I carried around for for a whole bunch of years. What was the precursor to all of that was me getting locked up in a psych hospital when I was eighteen years old. Being able to be free like that took going through this whole experience of like my life crashing down around me and realizing that I needed to, you know, I only got one life. I better, I better live it well. Yeah. Tell, well, tell us about that experience of hospitalization. What was it that was going on that got you to that point? Well, this is, this is like the, the, the classic Sasha story that started the Icarus project, right? I, I, I wrote the story in the San Francisco Bay Guardian and the first lines of the story were I was 18 years old. The first time they locked me up in a psych ward I was walking on the subway tracks in New York City and I thought that the world was about to end and I was being broadcast live on primetime television on all the channels. When I was 17 years old, I, I, uh, I went off to Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and um, I had a lot of pressure on my family to, to succeed academically. Did I mention that part? I mean, it was, a lot of it actually came from my dead father. He had been dead for a bunch of years, but the, the pressure was still there. And so I, you know, I pushed myself in this way that wasn't, healthy for me. I mean, I just wasn't like, I'm not a super academic kind of guy and I never really have been, but that was kind of the, like I said, that was like the kind of milieu that I grew up into. And so I felt like that was what I had to uh, live up to. And so all of that pressure um, mixed with living in Portland, Oregon, you know, in the early nineties. And I was like a kid from New York city that was used to smoking, like what we'd call like Mexican dirt weed. And suddenly you get out to, you know, the Pacific Northwest and the marijuana is really strong and the coffee's really strong. And, um, I'm reading Plato, you know, Plato's allegory of the cave, basically the way to, you know, like one way to describe what happened to me, it was like living out Plato's allegory of the cave. It's like the story <laughs> where the, um, you know, all the people are staring at the wall and they're seeing all the shadows uh, and then the one guy breaks th free and, and gets out and realizes that everything that he's been looking at his whole life are just shadows of the real. And that there's this real world out there. So I had this really transformative, really spiritual break, you know, this like awakening. But the way that it, it translated, I mean, I think, I imagine if I was raised religiously, I, you know, I would have been talking about God. But I was raised by a man who read Marx. And so I talked about it in the context of the revolution you know like i mean i had this like and i had this kind of like messianic experience of feeling like i was a bridge between worlds and i had this um it was a, it was a series of visions and it, i also the thing was i was really sick and i thought i was going to die i mean i was having like i was really allergic to i had had an allergic reaction to penicillin so i was in a lot of pain and i thought i was going to die and i had this series of visions about the world ending and us all living on on something that was like television. So, and it's like, a, you know, I mean, I, I wrote about it at the time. I mean, I still have it. It was like this vision about this other world. Years later, when, when MySpace and Facebook started emerging, I, I, I got, you know, chills <laughs> looking at it because I realized that it was actually really similar to, you know, my visions when I was a teenager are kind of coming true in this this freaky way but right because we're when we're part of social media networks like facebook and myspace we're kind of like broadcasting ourselves live to the world <laughs> like we're all living on television now after the end of the world in a sense like your vision yeah right and the internet didn't really exist in 1993 when i was going through this so it was just kind of i was picking up you know i was just like a i was a I was just picking up on all this stuff and, and I was seeing things happen way faster than they were actually happening. 
it's really interesting. A lot of people who have that that extreme opening, that spiritual, and then it gets called psychotic or gets called a manic episode. Actually, there are really powerful clairvoyance experiences that happen, very powerful prophetic experiences that people do have a sense of what's coming in the future. And it sounds like in some sense, that's also what, what happened to you. Yeah, for sure. It's what happened to me. And I there was I had no way to cope with it. I didn't have anyone around who had any kind of sense of what I was going through. And the actual the actual event itself, you were under a lot of stress. You were smoking all kinds of really powerful Pacific Northwest marijuana. Sounds like you were, you were sick. I think you also mentioned at one point that you were taking medications like prednisone, which might has side effects that can sometimes drive people into manic or psychotic states. You're under a lot of pressure from your family to succeed. You're really far away from home. I imagine maybe you weren't sleeping a lot. You had stopped sleeping or was it those are the some of the kind of factors that went into your your break? All that. <laughs> All that. And you know, and and I had a ton of energy. It was like I didn't need to sleep and I was like just running so fast. Now, in hindsight, of course, it's like really clear what was happening. But at the time, it just seemed like the world was ending. <laughs> you know, so and and then, you know, and then the billboards started to I, I started to see all these messages in, in the billboards that other people weren't seeing and the radio would come on and it took on these like larger than life mythic implications, everything. Sounds both simultaneously frightening and also really positive and exciting in a sense. Oh God, it was amazing, you know? <laughs> it's kind of amazing that, that it, this experience that we're talking about ended up becoming years later when I wrote about it, the experience that all these other people read and were like, oh my God, I've had the same thing happen to me too, you know? And, and that was really what started the Icarus Project. Because you wrote about it in a cover story for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. And my, my memory is that all these people just got so interested in it and wrote you and contacted you. And that was really the, really the seeds of starting the Icarus Project with Jack McNamara and getting the Icarus Project going. Sasha, what at what point did the exciting, connected with the end of the world, super high energy, visionary state. At what point did that actually get you into trouble and then land you in a, in a hospital? And then what happened next? Basically, my friends in Berkeley, California, were, didn't know what the hell to do with me. And so they put me on a plane and I went back to my mom's house. My mom was going to take me to a hospital the next day or so. She, you know, she said, I think she said, she was going to take me to a man who could help me. Were you just really disturbing to people around you? you wouldn't stop talking, or they just they, you obviously seemed like you were in really really bad shape. Or yeah, man, I was like talking a mile a minute, and I was ta you know talking about all these things that were scaring people, and they were scared of you know, and and I th and no one had ever seen within my little crew of friends that ever not that had never happened to to anyone. And so it was totally unfamiliar, you know, it was totally uh, like we didn't, there was no like language to talk about it. And so it was like, well, let's get, let's get Sasha back home. Unfortunately, home is like for me and like a lot of people, home is not actually the, the place to, uh, to go to, to, <laughs> to work out your stuff and relax. It's not a sanctuary. It's another stress factor on top of all the other stress you're going through. Yeah, man. And as soon as I got back to New York City, it was like the whole, it was like it just ratcheted up another 10 notches, you know. And I had this day of wandering around the streets, you know, talking to spirits and having visions and and like knowing that I was going to die. Like I was sure that I was going to die that night. And somehow, I'm not, I'm not going to remember exactly how it played out, but basically at some point I walked down into the, the path train on 23rd Street, um, you know, the, the subway that goes to New Jersey. And I hopped the turnstile and I hopped down onto the tracks and started walking. And I walked all the way. They pulled me off the tracks in Christopher Street. So that's a long way. And they took one look at you and said, this guy needs to go to a psych hospital. Yeah. And they sent me to Bellevue, which is like the, it was the hospital around there, which years later I would end up in again. <laughs> Actually, the, years later, I would end up giving lectures in and then, and then getting, getting locked up in again. And then when you were in the hospital, what, what happened? You were given a diagnosis, you were put on medications. And then what was your, how long were you in the hospital? I was in the hospital for two and a half months. I mean, that was back in the days when they actually would keep people in the hospital for a while. I mean, those days have ended a, a while ago, but um, they kept me in the hospital for a long time. They put me on Haldol and Depakote, diagnosed me manic depressive. You know, I spent two weeks in the quiet room. I mean, I think it was two It was a long time. You know, I spent a lot of time drooling on myself from being on Haldol. And then I got out, you know, and, and uh, moved back in with my mom and tried putting my life back together, and eventually did. 
And you said earlier that that experience of being locked up then later on had the effect of really driving this search for freedom and you just really going out and being part of the punk community and traveling on freight trains and, and moving around the country and music and squatting and yeah well picture this like pent up kid who's always wanted to break free and never really been able to do it i met these folks in a bar and they were heading down to new orleans for mardi gras and i caught a ride with them and and then i caught a ride to austin texas and then from austin texas i caught a ride to flagstaff arizona and then just you know i was hitchhiking around the country and um it's really funny actually what like the first big thing that i ended up doing when i dropped out of school was organizing this traveling circus with a crew of my friends and um Basically, we were just a bunch of drunk punk kids traveling around trying to convince people to quit their jobs and drop out of school. And it was totally outlandish what we were doing. And that's actually like around the time that I learned how to ride freight trains and, you know, ridiculous, ridiculous. Like in retrospect, I'm like, man, what was I doing? You know, but also a lot of fun when you're 20 years old. Yeah, that's right. And and then I was really lucky because I, I wrote this whole zine about it. And then Autonomy Media, which is an anarchist publishing company in Brooklyn, actually published it as a book. And so that was my first experience of realizing that I could write history down or write basically write down the story of my friends and call it history. And then it would turn into history. <laughs> and that was, you know, because years later, there's all these people that have read that story and have been inspired by it. I go back and look at it and I still kind of cringe. I'm like, man, what was I thinking? But, you know, like you never know the things that you're going to end up doing with your friends that are going to have a big impact on, on other people's lives. Well, one of the things that you were involved in was the beginnings of the permaculture movement and the kind of radical farming scene. What, tell us about that. Permaculture started as a movement in Australia in the late 70s. But what I was a part of was the um, the kind of taking of permaculture, which was really a, a design practice. It's a way of looking at how humans design things you know their their the land that they live on and the the um the food that they grow and modeling at it after how things happen in nature and really taking that set of principles and and helping to popularize it within the DIY anarchist community and having it spread out there i had a I had a column in this punk rock magazine called Slug and Lettuce for eight years that was pretty much a gardening column. So you were promoting gardening among the punk rock kids. Yeah. I, the, I think for a lot of us who grew up in the city, totally alienated. I mean, I, did, I grew up on the 12th story of an apartment building in Manhattan. So for me, um, growing a garden was an incredibly empowering experience and getting to grow plants to seed and then saving the seeds and then planting them again the next year. I mean, for, for me who never saw any cycles of nature, you know, re like really be being so consumed in an urban environment, it was a really, um, it was a really powerful thing. And one of the things that, that we started out there that ended up becoming, that's still around, that's really kind of amazing, was basically creating a community seed library. Because in the early 90s, there was this whole thing that happened with Monsanto Corporation where they, you know, this, this multinational chemical company genetically engineered uh, a seed to reproduce sterile. You know, they, they got labeled um, Terminator seeds. And it was this big wake-up call to a lot of us about the importance of saving our own seeds and having taking taking the power out of the hands of the corporate agribusiness giants and putting it back in the hands of the community. Which is a theme that gets carried on through to the Icarus Project in regarding mental health. There was this whole thing that happened in at the end of the nineties, right at the turn of the of the twenty first century, um, where there were these big protests that happened in Seattle against the World Trade Organization and all these people from all over the place came together um, to fight against the corporate takeover of the world. And it was exciting times. I mean, for those who were around, I'm assuming some people listening to this were around for it and some people were kids and, and not paying attention. But there was basically there was this period of time between November of 1999 and September of 2001, you know, when, when the World Trade Center bombing happened, where there was a whole lot of us that were very busy working on very radical projects. It was looking like a whole lot of change was going to happen really fast. And then we kind of, we got, had a big, a big boot came down and <laughs> stepped on us. You know, we had to go back underground. 
If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and we're speaking with Sasha Altman de Brule. Sasha is a writer and a gardener and a strategist for the Mad Revolution. He is a co-founder of the Icarus Project and currently lives in Oakland, California. Sasha, at what point did you become inspired to write about your hospitalization experience for the San Francisco Bay Guardian, which then led to the Icarus Project being started? In 2001, I ended up getting hospitalized in Los Angeles. Um, I ended up spending a month in L.A. County Jail. And it was a very similar, eerily similar experience to the experience that happened when I was 18. Basically, similar kind of theme of not sleeping for a long time, thinking the world was about to end, thinking I was being broadcast live on television on all the channels, that, that whole trip. And I came out of it pretty humbled. But also, really, the, the other significant thing about it was that I came out of it taking medication. I mean, I was taking psych drugs, which is something that I never thought that I'd be doing, you know? I mean, and, and it was, was in fact, mm -hmm. the, um, it was the work with the sustainable agriculture work and, and the work against industrial agribusiness and Monsanto and you know, the chemical companies that made me say, like, wait, what, what, what am I doing? I'm taking these drugs that, the, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is so evil on so many different levels, you know, and they just want me to be addicted to these drugs. And lo and behold, I'm taking them and they seem to be helping me, you know, and I felt really strange about it. And um, so it kind of broke your black and white view of the world, good and evil, and just sort of made you have a more humble understanding. Yeah, exactly. Because especially within my community, the, you know, you know, anarchists are known for being very free and very open and, and not always very tolerant <laughs> of, of, like, uh, of, of differing ideas. And I think that there was, I was really scared about talking about, you know, about it with other people in my world. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, actually, because that was only 10 years ago, you know, but to think about it, it was really, the culture was really different at that point. So it was a big deal what I did, which was basically, well, this is what happened, right, is that our friend Sarah Belazikian, who was, who had been my lover and travel partner and partner in crime, and I mean, you know, we had actually hitchhiked all the way from New York to the Seattle protest together and, and um, was someone I loved someone I still love you know um she she jumped off a bridge and committed suicide and it was such mm. a shock to so many people mm. and it was such a shock to me I mean it was just so horrifying but it came at this point in my life where I was coming to terms with the, the kind of sensitivities that I have you know that I and that for me where I'm at that taking the psych drugs is actually really helpful for me so I wrote this column in Slug and Lettuce, that same magazine that I had the gardening column in, and all these people read it. And so that was the point, that was the first time, that was when I outed myself, you know? And then shortly after that was when I got the um, offer to write that article for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. And so I think if you go back and look at that story, you can see that I'm, I'm struggling and that I'm really looking for, I say it right at the end. I'm like that. I'm looking for other people out there who've had similar experiences that I'm not, that I, I don't want to feel alone in the world, that I want to feel like there, that I have other people that have my back and that we can figure out what to, how to take care of each other together. And the response to that article was, was huge. Yeah. Well, I learned this great thing, which is that when you bare your souls to a, when you bear your soul to a bunch of strangers, inevitably there's a whole lot of strangers that want to bear their soul back. And so, yeah, I got 40 responses, and there was there was something incredible about the responses because it wasn't like they were one or two line responses. They were um, people telling me their stories that you know that they were that they felt comfortable telling me, and um, that was really powerful. And it just happened to be that one of the people who wrote to me in that initial batch of responses was the artist formerly known as Ashley McNamara, who, like who we now refer to as Jax and Ashley Jax. And I ended up getting together and um, we stayed up all night brainstorming and in like the kind of way that manic people like to do. And then we decided to start this thing called the Icarus Project. And it started as just a, basically as a, as a website, as a way of connecting people who had found each other through your article. Yeah, I mean, when the Icarus Project started, it was a website. And then at the same time, and, and I think that one of, the, one of the reasons that it ended up working was that as the website was, was going online, I did this whole um, drive around the country going to community centers 
and um, friends' houses and, and facilitating these discussions about mental health in the activist community. When we started the project, it was really bipolar focused, you know, which en- didn't end up lasting very long because it, as, as we figured out pretty quickly, there was a lot of people who were resonating with the stuff we were talking about who didn't consider themselves bipolar. And it, was, it also was a project that was initially for activists. I mean, people who were like, who were doing political work and that also didn't last very long and it kind of spread out quickly onto lots of other people. But because of the the activist nature of the people who were using the project at the beginning, the wealth of incredible writings that were going on on our website really helped lay the foundation for the kind of community that ended up blossoming out of it. Yeah, if people aren't familiar with it, they should really check out the Icarus Project.net. Icarus is I C A R U S Project.net. And there's just a wealth of poetry and art and writing and incredible conversations. There are more than 10,000 people who have registered on it. It's become very successful. It's reached out into a number of different countries. There are local groups uh, around the U.S. There are a number of different publications. And, and you really brought your own um, roots from the punk rock, squatter, seeing the traveling scene, and also this this angle of permaculture and gardening and challenging monoculture. And Jax, Ashley McNamara brought in a visual artist side. So the site is very, very beautiful, and it's always attracted people who were artists and, and designers and photographers. And tell us just about what the vision of the Icarus Project was and sort of how it, how it evolved. I mean, I think the vision was really about trying to reframe the way society conceives of what is considered mental illness the the myth of icarus is the you know the myth of this boy who has wings and doesn't know how to use them and ends up flying too close to the sun and what we were saying was that you know rather than seeing ourselves people diagnosed with mental illnesses as being diseased or disordered you know we see ourselves as having dangerous gifts like having wings you know and that and that reframing just that little bit of language was so empowering for so many people that we it it like it created this open space where people could start talking about what the kind of lives they wanted to be living because up until then you know there was this whole dialogue about trying to eradicate the stigma of mental illness words are so powerful right so the the way we talk about ourselves ends up having such an influence on how we think about ourselves. So, I mean, I think that the the initial vision was to create space for social and cultural change. And really pretty quickly, I would say, maybe it has something to do with the kind of grandiosity of the people who were, you know, in the project themselves. We started thinking about ourselves as laying the foundations for a movement, you know, and like really helping to build something that was going to end up having a much larger kind of impact on, on society. And that way we were talking about before of having something coming from the underground that ends up influencing the the popular the mainstream. That was the thing that really inspired my own involvement. I've been involved with the Icarus Project in a number of different capacities for, for many years now. It was just seeing the incredible creativity and how people were saying that, look, this is not a, a, a liability. We have a visionary side of ourselves. We're not going to define ourselves as ill and disorder. We're actually going to tap into the positive side of what we go through. And even though it does have a strong activist and political aspect to it. And it's, of course, challenging pharmaceutical companies and challenging the DSM and the American Psychiatric Association. It's not just about being against something. It's also about helping each other and creating a supportive community where people can, who are isolated and alone, can, when they're in crisis, can log on to the site and find other people to talk to who aren't going to judge them or stigmatize them or you know, just, just tell them, oh, this is just a sign of your illness, but actually really reach people from a place of shared experience. And one of the things I love about the Icarus Project is the incredible uh, diversity. I mean, there are people who take medications. There are people who don't take medications. There's no single interpretation of what madness is or whatever we want to call what gets labeled as mental illness is. There's more of a dialogue and a discussion because, again, going back to some of, I think, your root experiences uh, when you were younger, Sasha, a lot of it is about what is what is identity? How do we invent ourselves? Who do we want to be in the world? Who are we in the world? What are the stories that we tell? How can we explore the, the identities that confine us and embrace identities that help liberate us? I think you and Jax really tapped a very powerful cultural shift, and it was the right place at the right time. And 
all these people really needed something like the Icarus Project. And so I think collectively, the whole culture just helped make this thing happen. And now it's, it's very successful. And that's not to idealize it. I mean, it's not for everybody. And there's all kinds of problems. And it's an activist group that's volunteers and all everybody's all this stuff is always going on. But there's something at the core of it, which is really creative and really wonderful and has really inspired a lot of people, I think. Yeah, I mean, that that whole question of identity that you were mentioning a, a moment ago, I mean, I, I think that one one thing to talk about when, in this, if we're going to tell this, this narrative of the Icarus Project is that the next really big thing that ended up happening was that we started doing this organizing on college campuses and we ended up getting, we ended up partnering with an organization called Fountain House in New York and they gave us an office in Midtown Manhattan and suddenly we went from being we went from being two people you know like just working out of the back of our pickup truck to suddenly having a a collective of folks that were working together and figuring out how to work together collectively and not taking a traditional nonprofit model but also having access to funding which allowed us the space to be able to do a bunch of stuff that other groups couldn't and creates its own its own set of unexpected problems when you start to deal with that yeah. Yeah. and a lot of media and a lot of media coverage and publications being translated into other languages and a real widespread impact so it really took off on the internet and then there was also this growth that started happening on college campuses and also to local groups so there's actually people meeting face to face not just online we ended up being really inspired by the the LGBT movement, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender movement, and how they have been so successful at organizing on college campuses. I mean, basically, we looked and saw, wow, here's an organization that finds kids that feel like freaks and feel alienated and alone and gives them a space to feel like superstars, you know, and, and um, teaches them their history and gives them a community to be a part of. And we realized, wow, that's actually we want to do something really similar and it just hasn't been done. Yeah, one of the key campus allies is uh, Brad Lewis on NYU campus and we actually did a Madness Radio interview with him about this idea of mad pride, that there are real parallels with gay pride, queer pride, and mental health issues. So this idea of, of mad pride at the same time, there are some real differences, but they share this idea of challenging how the mainstream culture identifies you and puts an identity on you and really says, hey, we want to identify ourselves. We want to create our own language. We want to really find communities and come together where we don't have to be hidden and in the closet, where we can actually talk about who we are. And we can actually feel good about the positive aspects of our experience rather than feeling alienated, isolated, and separate by the larger institutional reality where we, we kind of get lost. Totally. And so that whole that that whole idea of mad pride I think really was inspiring to a bunch of us you know and looking at the success of the LGBT folks and how they created the safe zone training the model that they were using to educate their allies and the whole concept of allies and you know there's this whole other whole project of um, what we were calling um, wellness maps or mad maps of like helping folks who were struggling to to identify what the the things they needed to be able to to be healthy and like how that all kind of integrated in. I feel like there was this moment of campus organizing where there was like this rich body of stuff we were drawing upon and then at simultaneously coming up against the mainstream institutions. I mean, working at New York University was a trip because it was so like here we were a bunch of radical anarchists sitting there having these meetings with these high up officials, you know, who were so terrified that we were going to be talking publicly about suicide. And yeah, it's interesting to see the development of that because there are some campuses around the country where the um, administration says, great, students want to get together and support each other around mental health. That is fantastic. We need peer groups. And then there are other places like NYU that said, well, actually, we need to have a counselor present and we need to have a certain amount of control. I'm really nervous about this idea of the, the inmates taking over the asylum. And, and I think that's, really, that's a really important parallel because the, the gay community, the queer community really drew on its own resources to figure out how to support each other. And I think that's really the essence for me of the Icarus Project is saying, look, you know, we have been trying to rely on doctors and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies and therapists. And it's just for a lot of us, it's just not working. And in fact, it's hurting a lot of us. So let's get together and develop our own tools, our own ways of supporting each other. We can understand what we've been through better often than professionals can. So we're the ones who want to turn to each other 
when we're, when we're in crisis. And for a lot of folks, I mean, that has been tremendously valuable and tremendously helpful. And, you know, it's, it's also much more cost effective than putting tons of money into these giant institutions to have communities where people are, are helping each other and preventing crisis and, and teaching each other, what do you do about something like sleep? Or how do I understand, you know, the, the stresses that I'm under that make me feel suicidal or that what, how do I interpret the cutting or the eating? I mean, the, the kinds of discussions that are going on around self-care and how to support each other at the Icarus Project website are just tremendously valuable, not just for people involved with Icarus, but I think for the society as a whole, it's really pointing a way for kind of a community self-help around mental health that we all really need. Agreed. Agreed. Sasha, tell us about what you've been doing recently, because you're making this really interesting connection between um, your work with the Icarus Project and radical mental health and some of the evolution of the human potential movement and how activism uh, from the 60s kind of evolved into uh, human potential and self-realization and growth and sort of the spiritual, psychological, personal development side of things. Well, the way to tell the story is to just be straight up and say, you know, in the year 2008, in the midst of stepping back from the Icarus Project, I had this crazy psychotic breakdown and it was really dramatic you know I was giving one week I was giving a lecture at Bellevue Hospital to a room full of psychiatrists and residents and two weeks later the police brought me to Bellevue in handcuffs and it was some of those same residents that were taking care of me you know and so basically I went from being in a place where feeling very empowered about the the work that we were doing with Icarus to just being a mess, you know? I mean, and it's, it's a longer story, obviously, but I, I tell it because what ended up happening was something that never would have happened otherwise, which was that I went and lived at a yoga ashram for nine months, you know, which was like way out of my kind of frame of reference. And it was really only, I just didn't know what else to do. You went there to kind of rest and take care of yourself and sort of retreat and get your head back together after being in the hospital. Yeah. And like, and it was incredibly, incredibly helpful to be in a place where there was a regimented schedule where I was up at five o'clock every morning, meditating from 530 to six, like chanting and then doing yoga asanas for two hours and just eating and then working all day. I mean, I just had this very set schedule that for me, what I'm having a hard time is really super useful. But living in that environment was really challenging, you know, because I was around all of these people. I was living around people talking about God all the time, and I'd never been a, in living in a spiritual community ever. It was so not the language I was used to talking about things in. And um, what I figured out pretty, pretty quickly was that it was the same kind of folks living at the ashram who would gravitate towards ashram life that would be at an Icarus meeting. That it was actually like the same kind of folks who have a hard time in the world outside, but who are really um, searching and, and looking for community and looking for meaning. And although we don't use the language of spirit so much when we're talking about Icarus, it became really clear that there is something very spiritual about what we do in Icarus. And so amidst all that, you know, so there I was, it's like a, it was a bizarre scene. It was a, you know, a yoga ashram based on, you know, where we were bowing down to, to deities of Hindu deities, Ganesha and Krishna and Shiva. Um, it was run by Israelis. It was like it was a very it was it was a funny funny scene, but it was really super useful to for me. It was like a living in a place where I was meditating twice a day, where we were so focused on on being present and focusing our awareness and on these higher levels of reality. It created all this space for me that I'd never had before. I think it was after a few months of being at the ashram that it started to become more clear to me that I really wanted to be living a life where I was more present. I'm someone that likes to talk about the future a lot. I'm someone that is really talking about, you know, the history and the past and then, you know, what we're going to do in the future once we've laid the foundations to, to do it, you know. But actually being present in the moment is challenging for me. And I started to have this realization the kind of realization that you have when you when you have a lot more space, you know, and you there's just a, like the this quietness kind of opens up inside that madness, you know, what we were calling madness is not what I feel like basing my life around that neither madness nor pride really are things to try and cultivate, you know, to try and have a have a happy life. The thing is, of course, I still consider myself very much a part of this mad movement that we're all part of. You know, but I, I'm also very aware that there's something else 
that like working towards madness is not what we're not what we're going for so from that place of really getting in touch with present experience you started to have some insights about how to evolve your mad pride activism and and what directions this radical mental health movement that you've been a part of uh, really needs to go it sounds like going off to the ashram and leaving everyone and being in the space around all of these strangers who had this totally different worldview was such a useful thing for me because it allowed me the space to be able to look and see the the pieces that for me were really missing because within the dialogue around mad pride you know we're there there's a lot of inspiration and there's a lot of power there but there's some stuff that's not there i feel like that it would be really useful for people in our movement to look, to, to dig under the recent history and look at what was happening in the 1960s and the 1970s in what um, ended up being called the human potential movement. The first time that I saw that phrase written down, it just struck me because I, I realized that, you know, mad pride is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a powerful idea but without a foundation of something that goes beyond madness and pride, going to be something lacking there. You know, it's a way, it's a, it's a point of unity. It's a way to bring people together. It's like an underdog thing. You know I mean? It's like the, it goes all the way back to like the punk rock identity I had as a teenager, you know, this thing of like us against the world, you know, and like we're the freaks and we're the, you, you know, we're the, we're the outlaws. But there's something about, laying the foundations for a movement that could really embrace large segments of society that we're, where we could really where we can embrace ourselves for who we are but really look at our potential if you look at what happened basically starting in the early 1960s and through the 1970s there was this whole really rich history of um, Eastern spiritual practice and Western psychotherapy merging in these ways. There was the rise of something known as humanistic psychology. And there was the rise of something, you know, called the encounter movement. And there, like, were a whole bunch of spaces that ended up getting opened up for dialogue and experience that just hadn't existed in the 1950s, you know, in the in the United States. And I think that so many of the people of my generation who were part of what we call the mad movement don't even know about this earlier wave of history because really there there was like like our precursors were right there and the reason that we don't know about it really has to do with what happened in the 1980s with the rise of the biopsychiatric model like so many of the things that were having an impact in society ended up getting crushed and um there was a real kind of um rollback of all kinds of powerful movements you know so I, I was really lucky. Basically, what happened was I ended up at this ashram, and then one day there was this young woman who had a book about this place called Esalen, and I started reading it, and I was totally blown away. I mean, I just I had never, I had never heard of Gestalt therapy, and didn't know anything about Joseph Campbell and Alan Watts, and and like the this whole really rich culture called the Human Potential Movement. What's the most exciting part of that that you think? we can all learn from people involved with the Icarus Project and alternative mental health and people who are interested in different ways of looking at madness. The story that's really interesting that ties right into the how the psychiatric survivors movement and the human potential movement came together in the 1970s was that the co-founder of Esalen, this guy Dick Price, had been part of the beat movement and had been in the counterculture and then he was hospitalized, diagnosed schizophrenic, given shock treatments, you know, repeatedly, and then came out of there. And then he and his friend Michael Murphy founded this place, the Esalen Institute, really with the vision of creating a place where people could come who were living outside the mental health system. You know, they were really inspired by Artie Lang and the work that he was doing over in England and the, and the idea of like creating spaces for people who didn't want to end up in the psych system. And then it was Dick Price who ended up being inspired by this whole thread known as Gestalt therapy um, that made its way to, to Esalen through a guy named Fritz Perls. And it was this model of getting 
groups of people together and doing group therapy basically, but really intense group therapy. And Dick Price ended up taking that model and mixing it with Buddhist ideas and calling it Gestalt awareness practice and basically creating this congregational model of therapy is what they call it. There, you know, and it's this idea of being really present and focused with a, a room full of people and then focusing on individuals and breaking up into dyads and coming back together and and having this like group cathartic process that I think is super fascinating and like su- would be really useful to explore in the Icarus community. I mean, I've been having these fantasies about going around to college campuses and and doing it with rooms full of students. I've been thinking about how great it would be to take this practice, which is really like, you know, if you look at the history of it, it was developed by a guy who was a psychiatric survivor who had ties to the whole um, psychiatric survivors movement in San Francisco. And there was this whole kind of like interplay of stuff that was happening between, you know, Big Sur and, and San Francisco. It's really interesting. It's like a coming full circle in a sense. It brings together all the different um, yearnings and elements from your um, teenage and early 20s years that, that really kind of went into the Icarus Project and brings it all back full circle into thinking about how do we pull all these things together for some kind of new evolution, some kind of new form that, that could come next. Yeah, I feel like very much like in a gestation period, honestly, like I feel you should see like, I, you know, I have these incredible conversations with friends and I'm sitting here with all these different books and, you know, doing a whole lot of thinking about the future and, and thinking about what, what's going to be the most useful for the movement that hasn't, that, that doesn't even exist yet. You know, how do we take what we have and look at the lessons of the past and bring them together for something in the future? And I really do think that there's, there are a lot of important threads back in there in the 60s and 70s. Well, it's really exciting to think about what you might come up with next, Sasha, because you've, you know, you've been such a huge influence on the culture and the Icarus Project has been so powerful in so many people's lives. Sasha, we are just about out of time. Can you give us contact information and and mention again the Icarus Project uh, website? And how can people get in touch with you? You can email me at scatter, S-C-A-T-T-E-R, at theicarusproject.net. So T-H-E-I-C-A-R-U-S project.net. And then the Icarus Project website is just theicarusproject.net. You can just go online and like if you haven't already done it and th- th- this conversation has been interesting to you go like delve into that community it's amazing you know Sasha De Brule, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio such a pleasure Will thank you so much you've been listening to an interview with Sasha Altman De Brule. Sasha is a writer and a gardener diagnosed with bipolar disorder and he's a strategist for the mad revolution Sasha is a co-founder of the Icarus Project and currently lives in Oakland, California. You can find out more about The Icarus Project by going to www.theicarusproject.net. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lantzman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.